Last week we began our series with uh, a message entitled Free to Be. And we talked about how we have been set free to be who God has called us to be. And Dave Schellenberg shared his story of finding freedom. If you were here last week, you'll remember there were a couple of chairs uh, set up. Uh, If you missed it... um it sucks to be you. Um, <laughs> just kidding. If you, if you miss it, you can actually go to the website or to YouTube and uh, look it up there and have a listen. It's worth your time hearing uh, Dave's story and what God has done in his life over the last uh, 50 years. Um, we started with that story because we wanted to um, kind of lay the groundwork for what God is um, doing in each one of our hearts. That we have been called to be people who are free. And that if the Son has set us free, we are free indeed. And the truth is, uh, I've met uh, countless Christians who are still bound. They are still bound by something in their life and they, they haven't quite got to the place where they realize that Jesus has come to set them free. Uh, where he's come to set us free from addiction or free from our sin, free from condemnation, free from our guilt and shame, free from, free from ourselves. He came to give us new life and that new life would be the life that we live in him. And we began our theme our our week with a theme verse and it's going to be our theme verse for the next couple of weeks and it's found in Galatians chapter 5 verse 1 says it is for freedom that Christ has set us free so stand firm then and don't let yourselves be burdened again by a yoke of slavery Jesus came to set us free and it was for this freedom that he delivered us and I challenge you to read the rest of that chapter over the course of the week and perhaps you might even Commit it to memory. Uh, You might think to have those words really impressed on your heart and sink into your spirit. Because you may have questions like, what does it look like for me to be free? What does it mean for me to be delivered? What does it mean for me to be set free from things in my life? And what does it mean for me to be set free to other things? Like I said, I meet many Christians that are, who are bound. They're bound by fear. They're bound by the rules. They're bound by tradition. They're bound by their own sin. And one of the greatest gifts we receive when we turn our lives over to the Lordship of Jesus is not only the washing away of our sin, but the freedom that that redemption brings. Whoever the Son sets free, Jesus said, is free indeed. Last week we looked at this idea of being free to be. And this week we're going to talk about being free to love. It is Valentine's Day, so all you guys, I'm giving you two days warning in case you missed that memo. Uh, that uh, It is Valentine's Day this week and we're going to be talking about love. Not because it's Valentine's, but because it's the next thing that pops up in Galatians chapter 5. So if we keep reading after 5 verse 1, we come across these words. And it tells us a little bit about what's going on in the church in Galatia. Paul continues, Mark my words. I, Paul, tell you that if you let yourselves be circumcised, Christ will be of no value to you at all. Again, I declare to every man who lets himself be circumcised that he is obligated to obey the whole law. You who are trying to be justified by the law have been alienated from Christ. You have fallen away from grace. For through the Spirit we eagerly await by faith the righteousness for which we hope. For in Christ Jesus neither circumcision nor uncircumcision has any value. The only thing that counts is faith expressing itself through love. The only thing that counts is faith expressing itself through love. More on that in a moment. The church in Galatia that this letter was written to was dealing with a few challenges in navigating this new faith. Um, Jesus had uh, left, had ascended into heaven. Um, Paul had been... uh, issuing murderous threats against the believers. He had been hunting down these churches and uh, and, uh, was actually standing uh, standing guard, holding the coats. He acted kind of as a uh, coat rack for all of the guys who were stoning Stephen, one of the first martyrs of the church. And so the the gospel was spreading uh, under persecution and was starting to find its way into the outer reaches beyond Jerusalem. And then Paul has this experience on the Damascus Road where, where Jesus appears to him and says, Saul, which was his name before he became Paul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And so he has this moment where the blinders come off. He realizes who Jesus is and he devotes his life to serving 
Jesus and planting churches instead of destroying them. And so Paul writes to this church that has experienced this new life and this new faith, but is trying to figure out, well, what does it mean to be somebody who follows Jesus? Do we need to continue in the law? Do we need to continue in the Jewish faith that this um, new sect has been born out of? And there were some that claimed that in order to be faithful to Jesus, you had to first become Jewish in every sense of the word. It it wasn't just that the new faith had been grafted into the branch of Israel. In order to be a part of that branch, you needed to become like the rest of the vine. Now, we see ourselves today as connected to the people of Israel in that our story also finds its beginning in the story of Abraham and Yahweh. Um, the, the, the faith of the Jewish people is our faith because our faith was born out of this Jehovah who was reaching down to his creation. And so there are parts of the Old Testament story that are our story. The the story of King David, the the Psalms that we read today, those are prayers that we continue to pray because it is part of our rich heritage as followers of Jesus. Because we believe our Messiah, Jesus, was born from the house of David. Out of that line. But Christianity today looks very different from the faith of the Jewish people in the Old Testament. A a quick reading through Leviticus will show you that we don't follow all of the Old Testament law anymore. There are elements of the law that have either been completed or superseded by the work that Jesus has done on the cross. And so we don't follow those laws anymore. But the church in Galatia was trying to figure out, okay, well, which one should we follow? What what does it really mean to be faithful to God and follow Jesus? So they were starting to, in some areas, step back into the Old Testament law. And Paul writes this correction to say, like, hey, 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 if you step back, you've got to do it all. It's all or nothing. If we were to step back into the following, or into following the law, There are certain parts that would actually minimize or discredit the work of Jesus. Could you imagine if we decided that, like, we're not entirely sure if what Jesus did on the cross 2,000 years ago was enough to cover our sin, and we decided maybe we should, just to be safe, we should should start sacrificing doves and goats, even just once a year, Day of Atonement. Let's let's just make sure we get things covered off on the Day of Atonement, and uh, it's just, it's a way for us to show our faithfulness to God. What would that say about the cross? What would that say about what Jesus had done? Paul's language is pretty clear. He says, you who are trying to be justified by the law have been alienated from Christ. You've fallen away from grace. If you follow part of the law, you have to follow all of it, he says. Those are pretty harsh words. I know our language um, seems to be fair. Oh, you've fallen away from grace. You have been alienated from Christ. But the church was dealing with some believers who were infiltrating and, and really trying to steer them away from grace and getting them back into the law. That if you wanted to follow Jesus, you had to follow every letter of the law. That the Mosaic law was to be followed. Every one of them. And Paul argues that you don't need to adhere to all of those tenets of the law, and especially circumcision. That's the one he keys in on. If we keep reading, he says, You were running a good race. Who cut in on you to keep you from obeying the truth? That kind of persuasion does not come from the one who calls you. A little yeast works through the whole batch of dough. I'm confident in the Lord that you will take no other view. The one who is throwing you into confusion, whoever that may be, will have to pay the penalty. Brothers and sisters, if I'm still preaching circumcision, why am I still being persecuted? In the case, sorry, in that case, the offense of the cross has been abolished. As for those agitators, I wish they would go the whole way and emasculate themselves. I don't know when the last time you read Galatians 5 was, but this is one of the reasons why I love reading the Bible in its original context and thinking about what's actually going on in the church. This language that Paul uses, he is out to correct a teacher who is who is leading people astray. And he doesn't have too many kind words for that teacher. Now, it may get a little lost on us, but he says, you were running a good race. Who would cut in on you is the word that he uses. Remember, he's talking about circumcision. And the word cut in that he uses is to describe a scalpel or a sharp knife that you would use for various procedures if you catch where Paul is going. He's using some pretty sharp language to hint at that this circumcision thing is not the answer. 
This is not the way to Jesus. I'll let you draw some of those parallels. You were running a good race. Who cut in on you? The result of that cutting, it keeps you from obeying the truth. And he wants this person to be um, corrected. He, he wants them to know that this is not the truth. The only thing that matters is faith expressing itself through love. If you demand circumcision, you might as well abolish the cross, is what Paul says. You've become alienated from Christ. You have fallen away from grace. Those are pretty harsh words. But verse 12 is even more harsh. As for those agitators, I wish they would go the whole way and emasculate themselves. I don't know if you hear the Apostle Paul. I kind of want to bring it into like not T for teen language to help you really catch what he's saying. There's an exclamation point there. He's being a very pointed and clear. He's like, you know what? Why don't you guys don't worry about just taking a little bit off the top? <laughs> yep, that's in your Bible. I wish they would go the whole way and emasculate themselves. Paul, not too many kind words for people who are trying to lead people back into a bondage back underneath a different yoke. Paul is pretty worked up. He's passionate about keeping people's eyes on Jesus and that the work of the cross was more than enough. That it's not our adherence to the law that saves us. It, is, it saves us. It is Jesus and only Jesus. In another letter to the Ephesians, he writes these words. He says, as for you, you were dead in your transgressions and sins in which you used to live when you followed the ways of this world and the ruler of the kingdom of the air, the spirit who is now at work in those who are disobedient. All of us also lived among them at one time, gratifying the cravings of the flesh and following its desires and thoughts. Like the rest, we were by nature deserving of wrath, but because of his great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ, even when we were dead in our transgressions. It's by grace that you've been saved. And God raised us up with Christ and seated us with him in the heavenly realms in Christ Jesus in order that in the coming ages he might show the incomparable riches of his grace expressed in his kindness to us in Christ Jesus. For it is by grace you have been saved through faith. And this, not from yourselves. It is the gift of God, not by works, so that no one can boast. For we are God's handiwork, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. It is the gift of God. So these teachers were coming in and saying, yeah, 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 it's grace. But it's grace and... It's grace, but you also have to follow the Old Testament law. You also have to make sure that all of the men are circumcised. And Paul says, no, nope. it's grace and grace alone. Now today we might not wrestle with the same challenges as the church in Galatia, but I wonder if we don't add stuff to the gospel on a regular basis. I think each of us has a picture in our own mind of what a faithful follower of Jesus looks like. We have an idea of what it looks like for us, what we're striving towards, what it looks like for us to be faithful, to be people who honor God with everything that we say and do. We have, an, we have a picture in our mind of what a Christian looks like. I wonder, does the person sitting next to you have the same picture in their mind of what a follower of Jesus looks like? Or the person sitting on the other side of the church? I'm going to put up a couple of pictures here for you. And I want you, if you can, to help me discover who in this photo is a follower of Jesus. Who of these people are Christian? Who would worship a different God? Who would not be being faithful to the lives that Jesus had called them to? Just by looking at the pictures... It was funny, last night I showed Brenda this picture and she said, well, it's probably the guy in the black and white in the top, uh, the girl with the matching scarf to the guy in his cardigan, and uh, the three guys standing in the middle. Those are probably the Christians. I said, interesting, so the one who's smoking, the ones who are drinking, and the one with tattoos, those are the ones with... And she was like, oh, geez, I didn't even notice that about those guys. Uh, the truth is, every single one of those people except for the one in the hat who is about to beat a Christian, is a Christian. C.S. 
C.S. Lewis is the gentleman smoking the pipe. Uh, the, the, there's a Bible study happening over those beers as people are gathered in England where it is a little more socially acceptable to have uh, that sort of beverage. The guys in the middle are a punk band called MXPX. Um, yes! <laughs> uh, Coptic Christians in Egypt are down on the right. In the center are Christians in Israel. There is Mother Teresa. There are Chinese underground Christians. And then the top are Eastern Orthodox believers. The reason why I show those pictures is because for some of us, the top left looks really strange. That's not what Christianity looks like to them. To somebody else, the guy standing in a tattoo parlor, that's probably not the place that they would consider Christians hanging out all of the time. The truth is, we add disclaimers to the gospel all the time. It's Jesus and you have to wear a funny hat. It's Jesus and you have to or don't get to have tattoos. We have a picture in our mind of what a faithful follower of Jesus is. And the truth is, we don't know who is and who isn't a faithful follower of Jesus. Yes, we can check by their fruit. But if you saw somebody walking by on the sidewalk, you have no way of telling what God is doing in their hearts. But we try. We try to put boxes around people. We try to set up ways that we can agree on a certain level of things. So yes, it's Jesus only. That's the only way that we're saved. But if you want to be a faithful follower of Jesus, well then, you won't ever vote Democrat. Or NDP, or liberal, or insert, insert whatever political stripe you want here. Yes, you can follow Jesus, but you, do, you better make sure you support my political candidate. Yeah, you can follow Jesus, but you better not ever cuss, or drink, or smoke, or hang around with anybody who does. No atheist friends. Certainly no gay friends. And you better not be hanging around with any Muslims. We say it's all about Jesus and it's Jesus only, but we often live as though it's Jesus and or Jesus but. It's Jesus and you got to do all this stuff on the side as well. Or it's Jesus but, not that. It's Jesus but, you can't go there. Yes, I love Jesus, but I'm not going to hang around with any Muslims. And I certainly wouldn't greet them with a traditional greeting of peace. Salam alaikum wa alaikum assalam. Yes, I love Jesus, but you better make sure my border stays secure. You know, I don't want you letting in any of those refugees that turn out to be terrorists. Yes, I love Jesus, but truth and reconciliation? Come on. I wasn't one of the ones running a residential school. Because lest you think that these are only issues that pop up on your Facebook feed because you have friends who live in the States, it's one of the main reasons why I had to scale way back on my Facebook intake. I only look at it once a week now because there is so much animosity between brothers and sisters in the faith over issues like refugees and free speech and racism and gender issues. Because we've come to the place where it's like, it's Jesus and my soapbox. It's Jesus and this thing that I'm super passionate about. And I'm not saying you can't be passionate about issues. I'm not saying you can't believe what you believe about specific things. But if you link that to your salvation, you are in big trouble. Paul says you have fallen away from grace, that you have pushed yourself away from Jesus. If you've made that a condition of people's salvation, whether or not they believe in Jesus. Can we get back to the main call? What Paul says, the only thing that matters is faith expressing itself through love. The only thing that counts is faith expressing itself through love. And can I say that Facebook's probably not the place where that's going to get sorted out? It's not going to happen on Twitter. Um, we're not going to Instagram our way into a better society. Um, as much as I love social media, it's not going to get us where we want to go. Can we get back to the main call that we have been set free to love? The only thing that matters is faith expressing itself through love. You may not like to hear this from a pastor who's supposed to have the answers, but I don't have all of the answers. And where I don't have the answer, I will always, 
I will always err on the side of love because I would rather be loving than right. Because I don't think it's my job to judge. It's not my job to sort it all out. It's not my job to set things right. That's God's job. And one day he's going to do it. One day, everything will be set straight. When Jesus comes back, when he establishes his full kingdom reign, things are going to look very different. And my job is to reveal a little bit of what that might look like. What would it look like if God was actually in charge? It's my job to reveal the compassionate heart of God, to let people glimpse what it might look like if God was standing in front of them. And if things turned out the way that he really wants them to turn out. Because if you believe that God is okay with an eight-year-old being put into a life raft and set across a sea without her family to land in Lesbos and then be turned away and not granted refugee status, God isn't happy with that. God's not happy with any of that situation. Our job is to love. We have been set free to love. We are free to love our neighbors who believe differently than us. You're free to love them. You don't have to convince. You don't have to change. You don't have to wait till they change to start loving them. You're free to love your co-workers who are in same-sex relationships. You are free as a follower of Jesus to love people well. All people. You're free to love refugees who are fleeing their beloved home because of murderous terrorists. We are free to love those, those whose skin is a different color than ours, whose faith is foreign to us, whose culture might seem strange to us. You have been set free to love. And love looks a lot like listening. Love looks a lot like practical caring. It means sharing a meal. It means shoveling a driveway. It means offering to carpool. It means helping look after somebody else's kids. The only thing that matters is faith expressing itself through love. Paul continues in Galatians 5. He says, You, my brothers and sisters, were called to be free, but do not use your freedom to indulge in the flesh. Rather, serve one another humbly in love. For the entire law is fulfilled in keeping this one command. Catch that. He's been talking about circumcision. He's been talking to people who want you to keep the law. He says, okay, if you're going to keep the law, this is it. All of it is held up in this one command. Love your neighbor as yourself. If you bite and devour each other, watch out or you will be destroyed by each other. Next week, we're going to touch on that serve part of the passage, to serve one another in love. But this morning, I want to continue focusing in on love. We have been set free to love. You are free to love. Uh, Over the Rhine is the name of a band that I, I really enjoy. Husband and wife, um, Linford and Karen, uh, they weave beautiful lyrics over really gorgeous music. And uh, one of their older albums, an album called Drunkard's Prayer, has a brilliant little song on it. It's called Born. Um, and if you want to iTunes that, um, Born by Over the Rhine. In the chorus, Karen sings these words. She says, I was born to laugh. I learned to laugh through my tears. I was born to love. I'm going to learn to love without fear. I'm going to learn to love without fear. I feel like the greatest enemy to our obedience to that call to be free to love is fear. We fear what other people are going to think of us. We fear we're going to say something wrong or we might be on the wrong side of an issue. We fear that we're going to disappoint God or we're going to disappoint those around us. We've been so conditioned to fear. If you watch any news, it is ridiculous to me. I, the details that they put into certain stories, they put in to just push fear on us. They just, they're constantly teaching us how to fear. And there is no fear in the kingdom. That's not the way of Jesus. It's not the way of God. I'm going to learn to love without fear. We've been conditioned to fear people who are different than us. We've been conditioned to fear the other. Those who don't think like us or believe like us or look like us. I remember the first real conversation I had with a gay friend of mine. 
And uh, he was a co-worker at Starbucks. And he told me shortly after he started working at my store that he nearly quit working at Starbucks when he found out I was a pastor. And uh, we became friends. And Brenda and I decided one day we were going to We're going to try this whole loving people who are different than you thing. And we invited him and his um, partner, his now husband, over for dinner to hear his story. And uh, I knew that his journey included a lot of pain. Um, And his story is his to share. I'm not going to share his story uh, this morning. But suffice it to say, the church was far from loving when he was wrestling with his sexuality. And I will never forget, sitting in our basement, the comment he made about coming to terms with Brenda and I and the fact that we called ourselves Christians. He said, I don't know what to do with the two of you. Uh, You call yourselves Christians, and I have a hard time putting those those two things together because on one hand, I love you. But on the other, and he paused for a second... And then he said a phrase I will never forget. He says, you may not have killed any Jews, but you are still a Nazi to me. And I remember not knowing what to say in that moment. Not knowing, how do I redeem this conversation? How do I... And I remember saying to him that I thought all gay men were promiscuous looking to hook up at the club with whatever guy came around, that they had an agenda to make my kids gay, that they were trying to take over the world. And my picture of gay men was a flamboyant gay pride in drag, over the top, in your face, an angry man. And I told him that it wasn't fair to paint him with that same brush. And that I hope that he could maybe not paint me and other Christians with the same brush that he had in the past. You see, it takes listening to each other's stories. It takes loving those who are different than us, those who are the other. I believe Jesus was in that conversation and broke down just a little bit of a wall in his heart. It takes overcoming our fear and loving anyway. I remember being so scared uh, when we invited them over. What would they say? What would they do? How are we going to explain it to our small kids? Our like four-year-old daughter who then asks, so are they roommates? Oh yeah, kind of. But we really had nothing to fear. All we had to do was love, to listen and love. Now, there may be some who are here this morning that are concerned with even this topic and, and going into some of the areas that I've been talking about this morning. You're concerned with ensuring that we stay true to the gospel, uh, that we don't conform to the patterns of this world or compromise the truth in the name of tolerance. And I'm right there with you. What I'm suggesting, or actually what I'm advocating for this morning, has nothing to do with compromise or conformity. It is about respect It is about honoring the image of God in every single human being. Just because they believe differently than you does not mean they weren't created in his image. Just because their lifestyle looks different than yours doesn't mean they weren't created in his image and loved with an everlasting love. It's about recognizing where people are at and hearing their story right where they are. Because too often we've been so concerned with being right that we've forgotten what it means to be loving. In the interest of purity, of holding fast to the truth, we've alienated those outside of the church as if we need them to believe in Jesus before they come to him or before we'll even go to them. You can have Muslim friends and not convert to Islam. Shocking, I know. You can have atheist friends without losing your faith. You might actually enjoy learning about somebody else's faith or somebody else's culture or somebody else's way of life. I'm telling you the food alone is worth getting to know people who are different than you. (laughs) Because there are a few things on the list for like when the marriage supper of the lamb happens, there better be bannock dogs up there. Um... I was at a wedding where grandma made, okay, so it's bannock with hot dogs, like pigs in a blanket, but made with bannock. Yeah, that'll stop your heart in a hurry. Um, 
caribou chips. There are going to be caribou chips in heaven. There is going to be butter chicken. And goat, goat tali there is going to be, and pad thai. I shouldn't do this when we are uh, 15 minutes from lunch. <laughs> but if we are more concerned with being right than being loving, we have missed the point of the gospel. How else will people hear the good news if we aren't willing to love them? It's certainly not going to happen in my Facebook feed. I'm convinced that what Paul said there, the only thing that matters is faith expressing itself through love, is a great mantra for our lives. And that we need to learn to love without fear. 1 John 4 says, This is how love is made complete among us, so that we'll have confidence on the day of judgment. In this world, we are like Jesus. Pause for a split second there. In this world, we are like Jesus. It sounds a little bit cliche, but the only Jesus your neighbor might see is you. You might be the only revelation of God in their life. And think about the way Jesus treated people who were different than him. The Samaritans, the woman caught in adultery. The only people he had issues with were the people who claimed to be part of the club. In this world, we're like Jesus. There is no fear in love. But perfect love drives out fear because fear has to do with punishment. The one who loves, sorry, the one who fears has not been made perfect in love. We love because he first loved us. Whoever claims to love God yet hates a brother or sister is a liar. Whoever does not love the brother and sister whom they have seen cannot love God whom they have not seen. And he's given us this command. Anyone who loves God must also love their brother and sister. Anyone who claims to love God must love others. So we are free. We are free to love. And we're free to do it without fear. So what's holding you back this morning? Is it fear? Is it prejudice? Is it your theological viewpoint? Is it, what is it that blocks you from loving somebody who's different than you? What's keeping you from loving others well today? Because if Paul's right, we have been set free and we're not supposed to go back into another yoke of bondage, but we are called to love. That faith expressing itself through love is what really matters. So, think about your coworkers. Think about your neighbors. Think about those people that may take a, you making a step towards them. And what would it look like this week for you to love with a little less fear? To be more concerned with being loving than being right? What would it look like for you to be free to love today? Let's pray. Lord, you love each one of us with an everlasting, unconditional love. And each of us who are sitting in this room today are at different points in our journey with you. We are at different uh, places in life. Some of us have walked with you a really short time. Others have walked with you for decades there are some who are sitting here who question your existence. Uh, there are some who question whether you are for them. There are some who doubt and wonder. There are others who um, feel strong in their faith. They feel as though you are uh, a friend who is closer than a brother. And, and each, each one of us, regardless of where we are at this morning, we can know the truth that you love us. And that we only love because you first loved us. And so wherever we're at, would you help us to not only understand your love and receive it in our hearts, but to be free to share it with others. To reveal what the kingdom looks like, what it looks like when you're in charge. 
where there, there aren't tears, where there, there isn't prejudice and judgment, where there isn't pain and inequality, where there is freedom and hope and life and abundance. Protect us, Lord, from stepping up on our soapboxes when we're tempted to do that instead of loving. Help us to always choose love. Help us always to be people who reveal your truth through love. That it is our faith at work in us that causes us to love. And teach us. Teach us what it means to love without fear this week. So whether that's striking up a conversation with somebody who is newly immigrated to Canada, whether that is... um, connecting with somebody at the office or at the school that we've never connected with before. Whether it's reaching out to somebody who maybe even is a little hostile to the faith. Help us to be people who choose love and who love others well. Because we're free. It's not, it's not our job to save. It's not our job to convince. It's not our job to convict. Spirit of God, it is you who does all of those things. Help us to partner with you and make the way straight through love that we might tear down some of those barriers that people have between themselves and you. But they would see you for who you are. King of kings, Lord of lords, worthy of worship, and a God who loves each one of his image bearers. So Lord, we ask that you'd be with us this week, that your face would shine on us, that you would be gracious to us, that your spirit would empower us. And would you give us peace, we pray. In Christ's name, amen. Amen. I'm going to leave you with a benediction, also from the Apostle Paul. This is out of 1 Thessalonians chapter 3. He says, May the, our God and Father himself and our Lord Jesus Christ clear the way for us to come to you. May the Lord make your love increase and overflow for each other and for everyone else, just as ours does for you. May he strengthen your hearts so that you will be blameless and holy in the presence of our God and Father when our Lord Jesus comes with all his holy ones. Amen and amen. Have an awesome week. Remember to sign up for the uh, women's brunch. And if you're interested in helping out with family day, talk to myself or Sarah Ball uh, about that. We will see you next week.